Hi guys, I'm Dr. Riyash Mittal. We are a group of ENT surgeons who have started this channel to discuss various topics in ENT and try to bring a newer perspective. Stay tuned. Hello everyone. In this video, we talk about a condition that we see very commonly in the OPD as ENTs and physicians, allergy. Allergic disorders are underdiagnosed and they have a huge impact on the lifestyle of the patients. The cost of managing and treating allergic disorders is enormous. They may present as respiratory allergy, gastrointestinal allergy, skin allergy, ocular symptoms like conjunctivitis or anaphylaxis. The first step to their identification is taking a detailed history. If there is a suspicion of an immunological mediated reaction, then our history should first focus upon differentiating IgE versus non-IgE mediated reactions. IgE mediated reactions occur due to mast cell degranulation and they occur within 2 hours of the trigger or the symptom of, uh, or the exposure and they usually present as sneezing, urticaria, bronchospasm, angioedema or tachycardia. Whereas Non-IgE mediated reaction are usually delayed and they have non-specific symptoms. This identification of IgE mediated reaction is important because they are amenable to treatment with anti-IgE monoclonal antibody like omalizumab and allergen specific immunotherapy. The concept of unified airway explains that the lower and upper respiratory tracts are parts of a common organ and the inflammation of nose to the lungs can cause allergic rhinitis, otitis media, sinusitis or asthma. Allergic rhinitis. It affects up to 25% of the pediatric population and up to 40% of adult population. It is also closely related with asthma and it has been stated that about 15-38% to patients of allergic rhinitis also suffer from asthma and 6 to 85 percent patients with asthma have allergic rhinitis. Allergic rhinitis is itself a risk factor for asthma and its treatment can lead to decrease in the incidence and intensity of asthma. Allergic rhinitis may be seasonal or perennial. Seasonal allergic rhinitis is caused by outdoor allergens like environmental pollutants, for example oxides of nitrogen and sulfur and particulate matter. Perennial allergic rhinitis is caused by indoor allergens, the most common of which are house dust mite followed by pollens and animal dander. According to severity, it is divided into mild, moderate and severe variety. Non-allergic triggers like exercise, physical or emotional factors and drugs can mimic allergic rhinitis and need to be differentiated. Occupational rhinitis may be of allergic or non-allergic variety. The drugs causing rhinitis are most commonly aspirin or other non-steroid anti-inflammatory uh, drugs and other drugs like methyl dopa, rezapine, ACE inhibitors or alpha adrenergic antagonists. Asthma. <clears throat> As ENTs, we should be able to identify and diagnose this disorder. Asthma is a heterogeneous disorder characterized by chronic airway inflammation and variable expiratory airflow limitation. It can be allergic or non-allergic. The other phenotypes of asthma are late onset eosinophilic asthma, exercise induced asthma, obesity related asthma or neutrophilic asthma. The most common presenting complaints of an asthmatic patient are uh, shortness of breath, wheezing, tightness of the chest or cough. These symptoms are typically increased at night or early morning time and the triggers include exercise, laughter, cold air, allergens or uh, viral infections. In spirometry, the expiratory airflow limitation is seen as reduction in the ratio of FEV1 by FVC. And the variable nature of this limitation is signified by a positive uh, bronchodilator reversibility, which means that the uh, 
FeV1 increases by more than 12% after administration of inhaled salbutamol. A significant increase in lung function is noted after 4 weeks of anti-inflammatory treatment. The other tests which can be done for an asthmatic patient uh, are exercise challenge test, bronchial challenge test, allergy testing and fractional concentration of exhaled nitric oxide. Uh, we'll be discussing these tests in the later part of the video. Food allergy. This condition is enormously underdiagnosed. The most common food items responsible for allergy are cow's milk and eggs. The other common items are soy, wheat, shellfish, etc. The allergy symptoms which start early in the life usually tend to go away as the children develop tolerance as they age, whereas the late onset symptoms usually persist for life. Taking a detailed clinical history is really important as we have to differentiate food allergy from other non-allergic gastrointestinal pathologies. Therefore, a chronological uh, relationship should be found out between the allergen exposure and development of allergy symptoms. The abstinence of the allergen should also lead to improvement in the symptoms. Food allergy may present with specific gastrointestinal complaints or non-specific non-gastrointestinal complaints like respiratory complaints, urticaria, mouth ulcers, joint pain, night sweats, etc. As told before, food allergy may also be IgE mediated, non-IgE mediated or may have combined mechanisms. IgE mediated food allergy presents immediately and has uh, symptoms like urticaria or angioedema whereas non-IgE mediated food reaction uh, occurs late. It has delayed symptoms like enterocolitis, enteropathy and pulmonary hemocytrosis. Moving on to the diagnosis. The diagnosis of allergy is confirmed by various uh, tests. In vitro tests like total and specific IgE levels, absolute eosinophil count and basal, uh, basophil activation tests are available. In vivo testing includes skin tests. Provocation tests include bronchial challenge test, nasal provocation test and food challenge test. Supportive investigations include nasal endoscopy, radiological investigations, spirometry and fractional concentration of exhaled nitric oxide. Total IgE levels. They are neither specific nor sensitive for diagnosing allergy. Patients with parasitic infections, immunodeficiencies like AIDS, hyper IgE syndromes, Epstein-Barr virus infection and rheumatological conditions may also have a raised total IgE level and therefore False, uh, false positive for allergy. Also, normal IgE levels do not rule out allergy. The only role of total IgE levels from the point of view of allergy is while administering anti-IgE monoclonal antibody which is omalizumab. Total uh, IgE level is used uh, for dose calculation and to see the response later on. Allergen specific IgE levels they rule out the false positive uh, total IgE levels unless the total IgE levels are itself very high, in which case the specific levels may also be falsely positive. It is tested using um, the radioallergen sorbent te uh, technique in which the patient's serum is incubated over a cellulose disc. The disc is coated with specific allergens and the bound IgE from the patient's serum are detected. Although it is a good test for detecting type 1 hypersensitivity, inter-assay variation between different manufacturers is found due to non-standardized testing. Another fact to be noted is that uh, using crude allergens for detecting the specific IgE levels may cause cross-reactivity between different allergens due to common components and proteins between those allergens and therefore false positives may arise. To solve this problem, recombinant allergens and proteins uh, 
from the specific allergens have been manufactured. This is known as component uh, resolved diagnostic uh, testing (CRD) testing. This concept is also used for skin prick testing. The skin prick test. To understand the skin prick test, we should first try to understand about the two phases of type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. The first phase is sensitization when the initial exposure of the antigen causes uh, uh, the activation of the T cells. The T cells in turn cause the uh, class switching of B cells which leads to the production of IgE. During the re-exposure phase, these free IgE in the patient's serum and the IgE bound to the mast cells cause an immediate reaction to the allergen. In the skin prick test, allergens in very small and specific amounts are introduced through the skin which leads to an uh, immediate reaction in the susceptible individuals. There are two types of skin prick tests, epicutaneous and intradermal. The epicutaneous test involves pricking or puncturing or making a scratch in the skin. The skin prick test should always start with, a, with, an, uh, with an epicutaneous test and if the epicutaneous test is negative, even though there is a very strong clinical history suggestive of allergy, in those cases intradermal testing has to be performed. Intradermal testing is more sensitive but less specific and is more technically difficult to perform. So an allergic uh, skin prick test may be falsely negative or positive. There are several factors which can influence the results of the skin prick test. For example, uh, prior history of medication, age of the patient, the site which is being tested, etc. So the drugs. Uh, like antihistaminic drugs can interfere with the results of the skin prick test and therefore antihistaminic drugs should be stopped a few, uh, a few days before uh, the skin prick test is conducted. The reactivity of the test also depends upon the age of the patient and it generally re uh, reduces with the age. Also the reaction to histamine is smaller in infants. The back is more sensitive uh, to the test and in the upper uh, in the arm the anticubital area is more reactive as compared to the other areas so while performing a skin prick test a physician or a healthcare professional should always be present because there is a risk of a severe systemic reaction now the risk of this reaction is more uh, when we are testing food or medicine related allergens and a severe systemic reaction is very rarely seen seen in cases of respiratory allergens. Nevertheless, it should be taken into mind and uh, the patients suffering from dermographism, urticaria, uh, uh, eczema or a severe systemic allergic reaction should not be um, tested with a skin prick test at that time. It should be performed with extra precaution during the respective allergen season and it is relatively contraindicated in cases of pregnancy. Patients should also be screened for asthma before, uh, before performing the test and the patients with less than 70% of peak flow rates should not undergo the test. Patients taking beta blocker or ACE inhibitors are at higher risk because of reduced sensitivity to epinephrine in case of a severe systemic reaction. The test extracts should be stored at a cooler temperature uh, of plus 2 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius when not being utilized. The procedure is explained in detail to the patient and the attendant before conducting the test. Now, the test site is prepared by a 70% alcohol swab and then allow it to dry. If the skin is hairy, it should be shaven one day before conduction of the, uh, of the test. The waller aspect of the forearm is generally utilized with a distance of about 2 to 3 cm from the wrist and the anticubital fossa. To rule out the false positive and negative results, a positive and negative control is used. Uh, so 0.1% histamine dihydrochloride is the positive control and the diluent is the negative control. With the skin marking pen, the test sites are chronologically uh, marked starting from the negative control and ending at the positive control. 
the numbering is usually started uh, with a negative control. A few drops of the antigen solution are placed over the test sites and they are very carefully, uh, very carefully matched with the numbering on the recording sheet. The test sites are swiftly pricked with a skin prick needle which is pressed lightly against the skin and then is drawn upwards. A lancet, uh, a metallic lancet can also be used for the same purpose because of its excellent reproducibility which results in few false negative results. A new lancet should be used for every test site ideally to prevent cross reactivity between different allergens. The test sites including the positive and the negative controls should be read 15 to 20 minutes after pricking the sites. The negative and positive controls should be measured first. The largest diameter of the wheel of each uh, test site is measured. Another method is to take an average of the largest diameter and the diameter perpendicular to it. A positive reaction is defined as the size of the uh, wheel being more than 3 millimeters. The sensitive, sensitivity and the specificity of SPT is about 70 to 90 percent for inhaled allergens and about 30 to 70 percent for food allergens. The most important test in the provocation tests include bronchial provocation test. So in this test, methacholine or histamine is administered in the patients. Histamine acts via H1 receptors and it causes an increase in the bronchial and nasal secretions and causes bronchoconstriction. Methacholine acts on the M3 receptors and causes bronchoconstriction. So uh, the effect in the patient is seen and it can be quantified by a spirometry. So when is it indicated? The bronchial provocation test is usually indicated when the diagnostic tests like spirometry are not suggestive of asthma but there is a strong clinical suspicion because of the history. It can also be used to assess the response to asthma therapy and can be used to modify the treatment accordingly. The test is usually not recommended in patients with severe asthmatic symptoms and is absolutely contraindicated in patients with severe airway obstruction. Now exhaled nitric oxide. So nitric oxide also known as NO is released in very small amounts by the airway epithelium and the levels of NO are increased uh, with the increase in inflammatory cytokines like IL-3 and IL-4. Now we know that these cytokines are increased in allergy. So in patients uh, with allergy, uh, there is an increased fractional excretion of concentrated nitric oxide. Uh, this indicates inflammatory um, uh, pathology and is also indicative of steroid responsiveness. So the patients who are more responsive to steroid therapy uh, in case of asthma generally have higher level of uh, excrete, uh, excreted nitric oxide. This can also be used for detecting the non-compliance to steroid therapy and identifying atopic inflammation in the patients who are not able to perceive it yet. Now we talk about the diagnostic modalities for food allergy. The investigations include a diagnostic elimination trial food challenge test and the ex, um, and the in vitro and the in vivo testing. So we talk about the diagnostic elimination trial first. In this the elimination of the suspected food allergen uh, item is done from the diet. In, uh, in uh, the elimination is done for about 3 to 5 days in children with immediate reaction and up to 2 weeks in um, patients who have a delayed reaction to the food allergen. An improvement, an improvement is suggestive of food allergy. Uh, then epicutaneous skin prick test can be done but intradermal skin prick test is usually not done because of a higher risk of anaphylaxis or, or a severe systemic reaction. Food challenge test. If the in vitro specific IgE levels are negative but the suspicion of food allergy is there then an oral food challenge test can be done. The gold standard investigation for the food allergy is a double blinded placebo controlled oral food challenge test. Although blinding is generally impractical, therefore single blinded or an open food challenge test can also be done. The suspected oral uh, food 
the suspected food allergen is delivered to the patient in escalating doses uh, and the patient is kept under strict medical supervision for at least 2 uh, hours after uh, the administration of the uh, food item to observe for any adverse reactions. It should be done in a hospital setting with all the resuscitation facilities. If there is no adverse reaction, um, then milk and dairy products, if those are tested, can be freely introduced in the diet after two weeks.